working. And if we have time, we will uh, wrap up uh, with the whole idea. Okay, so the outline for today, the first part will be on human competences and dignity aging as a key strategy for the first and demographic dividend in the 21st century. And uh, in the last part of the session, we be to sum up with key messages that uh, by expanding from national and regional markets, it is possible to take advantage of different stages of the demographic transition that countries find themselves in. So this is to see the connection between the uh, intimate and the public sphere. Okay. Um, let's start with this one. When we talk about human competences and dignity aging, we cannot ignore what would be the future trend of um, to be going on okay, in the world. I, I rely on what Peter Drucker said in his book. He identified uh, several trends. Among others, he highlighted the developing world, which he said that uh, the, there are certain dominating factors in the next society, in the developing world that we should pay attention on attention to. One is the rapid growth in the older population. Another is the rapid decrease in younger population. Peter Drucker talked about the developing countries. But if you remind, if you think of Japan, which is a developed country, this trend also takes place in Japan, right? the rapid growth in the older population and uh, decrease in younger population. Do you know how many child population, those below 15 in Japan now? How many of them? Can you guess? said Japan has the lowest population, 15 below. How many of them there are in Japan right now? 10 million, 20 million, or what?
thinking that the growing uh, size of the proportion of the older population would make the traditional pattern of full-time office hours change to more temporary and part-time work. I don't know if this is the case in Japan now. But in, in developing countries, we are maintaining uh, full-time office hours. It's, it's the dominant trend. And uh, temporary or part-time is just something like uh, I'm not sure to take place. But in 20, 25 years from now, there will be more and more uh, temporary and part-time work in the developing world. So let's think about Japan also. If that would be the case, when you have, when you are graduated, you will have to be full-time or part-time job. This is something that you have to <coughs> think about. And if you would like to take full-time job, that would lead you to the topic of this class, competence. You would need good competence that meet the requirement in the world market. Otherwise, you may end up in temporary or part-time work. In the next 25 years, all the people will keep working until their mid-70s if health permitting. That is possible because of the science and technology, like uh, biomedical um, technologies. They will be um, able to work up to their mid-70s or even um, more. You in Japan may think, well, what is a surprise? Because in Japan, you have seen the elderly above 80 still working, right? But in the developing world, they don't. Okay. Surviving older workers in the future will be knowledge workers. Surviving older workers means those who can still have good job and enjoy life. They would have to be uh, knowledge workers because they can take care of themselves in terms of health, in terms of lifelong learning. So that's the makes them survive in the world market. The rapid decrease in younger population would cause an increasing flows of immigration into developed world because this is some kind of a unbalanced supply and demand in world market. Okay, and this is the situation in the world market in, in uh, uh, production things would ch be changed from uh, now it is you determined mass market would be it would turn to middle age determined. So if you uh, in when you go to work and you would have to work in a companies that serve the, um, the market the people that you have to think as buyers or consumers of your products would be more those in the middle age than the young uh, population. So this is something that businessmen and academicians has to think about. Uh, in the, the develop, developing world, there will knowledge will be key resources, key resource in the next society. Why this is mentioned for the developed world? Because the developing world is more labor intensive, the more manual, physical labor. But in developed world, it is knowledge, right? The K economy. But in future time, the knowledge economy would go into the developing world also. Okay? And the main characteristic of knowledge society would be borderlessness, upward mobility, and potential for failure and success are equivalent. Okay? Borderless. The there is you can go anywhere, okay? And virtually also. Okay, 
upper mobility in developing world with labor intensive, their mobility would move from this level of skills, I mean, horizontal, um, horizontal okay? But with knowledge society, horizontal movement is not the case, but more to more upgrade knowledge more and more, to, to be more competent, to be, um, to acquire new socialization of knowledge, okay? And uh, knowledge technologies are likely to become the dominant social and political force over the next decades. Some here are interested in politics, like when they come to Japan, to Kyoto, there was some kind of a political riots in Bangkok. And the key factors are the media man. Okay? But in future times, this is for Wataru also, if you want to do research, the new factors for politics would be the knowledge technologist. Okay, not so not just media. And then uh, there will be also new protectionism because there will be um, decline in manufacturing. Right now, in developing world, it's labor intensive manufacturers. But later on, there will be more services, tourism and others, and manufacturing will be declining. Multinational companies would tend to be dominant factors in the world economy. So, so far, if you think like this, when you graduate, and you were to go to, to work, and based on these information, what kind of a person you would like to be in order to get a job? Your job opportunities would be in multinational enterprises. That would be an option for you, a very good option for you, because it would be a dominating kind of cooperation in the world economy. And if you would like to work in multinational companies, it is necessary for you to have <coughs> to be competent in more than one language, more than one culture. You will also need some kind of uh, to be around here, knowledge technologist. Okay, so these are your future and this. Think about the competence or the attributes that you would like to have when you're a graduate. When we talk about um, ourselves in the future world, we will not just stand still, but we have to look into the future and try to reposition ourselves towards what is needed in the future. This is also the case in developing world and elsewhere, in Japan also, okay? There are three components for reposition and um, repositioning and developing human resources. One is uh, skill development, further training. So this tells you that you need to upgrade your skills at work or on the job training or whatever, formal or informal, on a lifelong learning basis, okay? Education, health also. But when we talk about education, here we are at university, we know that there are two procedures in schooling, teaching and learning. Sensei teach, right? Students learn, okay? But in practice, senseis also learn from students also. So that sensei would have some kind of new knowledge. 
and to produce new knowledge and new knowledge on and on. So when we talk about good education, people always say that there is some kind of a gap between the demand and supply, the demand in the labor market and the supply that the university has to produce a good uh, graduates to meet the requirement in the labor market. But in practice, that is not the role of university to do so. What the university needs to do is to equip students with just basic knowledge and self-adjustment capabilities. Others would leave to the students themselves to be to, to use this kind of uh, self-adjustment capability to develop, to develop their own skills and qualifications, to learn further and to be further trained because the, you will have to be trained in the uh, labor market anyway. So what the university has to do is to prepare students to be able to uh, have enough skill for pre-training and uh, on-the-job training with lifelong learning. Sometimes students don't understand what's different between training and skill to, to be trained. you need something, you need some kind of learning skill to be trained. Because sometimes you always just get and learn, but you don't have some kind of uh, the skills to, to, to be uh, further upgraded when people keep on telling you, they will say, I have enough already. I don't want to be told by others anymore. That is the lack of skills to be trained, to be further trained in the labor market. I'd like to give you uh, what people are saying about uh, developing world also. This is from the AGB. There are, they have classified developing world in Asia in four groups. One is low income. Why I have to bring these uh, issues to you? Because when you are in a developed world, you think that human competence are something that you already know. This is not uh, strange at all because people elsewhere also think like this. They didn't know that the way to reposition themselves to meet the world economy in the future would be different from one country to another. And from case to case, depend on what you already have. Like in the developing world, the low-income world, what they have is they have which the, the um, low, low wage in the uh, labor market, okay? And then they are uh, labor intensive. They rely on labor in intensive industries. So what is recommended for them is nothing else but to raise their labor productivity. Why? Because now it is still low. And in order to catch up with the world, um, the international competitiveness, they have to raise their productivity. And if they do so, um, the ADB said the, their international competitiveness is still large. So there's some kind of a potentiality for them still available if they get, the, get on the right track, which is to focus on productivity. The case would be different for middle income countries.
Here we have the Philippines as a middle income country. Can you tell uh, what are other countries that uh, belongs to middle income country? Philippines is one. What about others? Indonesia. What else? Can you tell? Malaysia, yes. What else? Thailand. Okay. Here, they said that um, there are they need a different set of human resource strategies in order to move towards uh, skill intensive activities in production. They have to reposition themselves from labor intensive to skill intensive. Okay. And uh, what they have to do is to give emphasis, this is the role of the public sphere, right? To give an emphasis on basic and applied science and technology on the on tertiary, uh, tertiary level curriculum in university, right? This is what is needed, the s &T, so that they will here be geared towards uh, skill intensive. And the, uh, so uh, in terms of the our research and development program is uh, also recommended. The new industrialized economies. Can you tell what are they? Taiwan, South Korea, Hong Kong. Okay. They are characterized in terms of uh, they aspire to a position of leadership in scientific innovations and technological advances rather than remaining as indicators. Do you think of South Korea? South Korea doesn't want to imitate technology from Japan anymore. Okay, and South Korea would like to be at the forefront in terms of scientific innovations. And they can do that. South Korea can do that already. What about others? Okay, but in order to strengthen their um, position, they would need some kind of management system which is flexible for research. As I said earlier in the case of the Philippines, this is what the Singapore government is trying to do in order to upgrade Singapore to leadership in scientific innovations. When university lecturers or researchers has got grants in research projects, a certain amount, the government would give them three times more to add to that project. That is what they are trying to do in out there in new industrialized economy. But when we are talking about Central Asia, there are also transnational, I mean transitional economies from socialism, right? In Southeast Asia we have um, we have uh, developing countries that is um, transferred from socialism to transnational economies also. But the case is different from here. Okay, this is in Central Asia because the difference is that they have already skilled manpower. But the socialist uh, transnational economies in Southeast Asia lack skilled manpower. 
So this is the difference between these two parts of the world, okay? And in order to uh, this part of the world to be competitive in the world, what they need is to identify that niche projects and area and the R&D, higher education. So you see that the focus would be different from one uh, case to another, right? John Nesbitt also identified trends for the future for us also. One, from nation state to networks, there will be more networks. So one nation state, one country cannot rely on their own. They have to rely on network. They have to create network, network creation, just like this program, COE program. This is innovation and rely on network, okay? Um, export led to consumer driven. This is, the, the world be changing like that. From Western inference to the Asian way. So this is the role of Asia, the future of Asia. If you are good, if you are with appropriate human competences, you can dominate the world. From government driven to market driven, so the role of the public sphere would be minimizing, okay? Central government control and direction of the economies have shifted to market economies. From village in rural areas to super cities, from labor intensive to high technology, from male dominance to the emergence of women, from Western world to the rise of the East. So this is the same as that one, right? But the key for us is here. Six, seven, three. Okay, this is three for us and four. The Asian strategic architecture. This is what uh, if you would like to be this is what Philip Conner said in his book, Reposition Asia from Bubble to Sustain Economy. So if you would like to have to let the Asia be uh, influential in uh, the world of birth in the future, this is what Asia needs to do, Asian countries. Okay? One is to position themselves exactly what they would like to be. So Japan would have to rip to position Japan. What Japan would like to be in future times, okay? One thing, we know that Japan would like to have sustained economy. And if Japan would like to have the largest emerging sustained, the economy? I don't know, but other countries would come to join this also, right? New Asia, the new Asia would be some kind of a, a thinking in both uh, academic, politics, and business world, okay? And this is what to do is to try to differentiate oneself from another. Like this COE program, that has to identify some kind of a niche of the program to differentiate the program from another. Okay, one thing is to rely on network and uh, to uh, become a world class program. Okay? To let students have ideas in terms of uh, others, what they are, okay? And to um, look not only in terms of the uh, a particular country, but to look in terms of, uh, of the region economy. Okay, and 
and not only to look in terms of the academic, whatever is academic, but to combine the economy, the politics, and the business, the real world together, okay? One thing is to keep balance between all those things and to adapt, okay? And the role of the government is recognized. This is in the economy. What would be needed? The IT, the world of IT, the agric uh, agriculture technology, manufacturing would be, there would need some kind of infrastructure in terms of uh, trade infrastructure, investment infrastructure, tourism infrastructure. Of course, the legal system must be there. Okay, this is the environment of the new world. So far, we have been uh, talking about what is going on in the world. Um, I mean, what will be going on in the world according to the gurus have been saying, okay? We are in Asia. People said that Asia would be the future of the world. But those who are in the um, looking to Asia from the perspective of the demographic dividend, we would say that that future is not guaranteed if we don't have appropriate um, policies and mechanisms to intervene to change what is going on now. People say that Asia is the future world because they rely on the look back to what Asia was, was uh, doing. Asia was able to reach the so-called Asian miracle, okay? And that is part of the demographic dividend that makes Asia becomes Asian miracle. Okay. Compare with East Asia. Not all Asia would be the future of the world. Like because when we talk about Southeast Asia, which is mostly um uh, middle income and low income economies. The demographic dividend that will be uh, take place in Southeast Asia will not be equal to those took place in East Asia when the Asian miracle was the case. Okay, because um, we have poor education compared to East Asia, okay? So uh, in order, if they would like to upgrade, to reposition Southeast Asia, to obtain, to maximize or to capitalize on the demographic dividend at the level equivalent or nearly uh, equivalent to East Asia, the HRD would be the case, would be the key point of concern. So when we talk about human resources, there are three key words that people are, that people keep on confusing. What are they? Sometimes they have, they are like competency, some say competence, some say competencies, IES. But they don't exactly know what are the difference between these three ones, okay? If you talk about competencies, it's person-related concept that refers to the dimension of behavior 
lying behind content performer, but for content to be work, more work related. So if you are going to get a job, okay, you may have to think what the what the business or what the um, enterprise that you were going to get in would require you to do, or what kind of um, uh, skills that you would have. The way you are thinking is more like this, more in terms of competence, very related. Okay. But when people use the competencies, there is some kind of combination between these two things. If we try to look at the three things together, this is more like a macro perspective at the role of the university to make students to become, to be, to be, uh, to be equipped with these kind of competencies. Okay? And this would be more in terms of uh, um, training, <coughs> in terms of skills. Okay. Types of competencies. There are just many things, okay? One is generally a specific um, performance, a threshold, and differentiating competencies. Um, basic competencies required to do uh, the job, which do not differentiate between high and low performance, okay? But uh, this include both, I mean, the threshold include both basic and performance competencies. The difference is that this doesn't uh, differentiate, but this do, um, this doesn't uh, differentiate between high and low performance. This is more behavioral um, characteristics that high performers display. This is, if you think like uh, those who are the high performers, you may think of like the diplomat. They would have special or some kind of uh, uh, characteristics that others that that others don't have. Okay, they have like negotiating skills. They know how to negotiate. They know how to um, be socialized. Something that uh, not many people can have. Okay, so this is for the um, high performers. Okay, and this is something particular needed for those who would like to get a job. You would like to be um, different from others. So. Now you may have to think when you graduate and you were to get into a job, what kind of a person you would like to be different from others so that when the human resource department look at you and pick you rather than others. They will see this when you go to an uh, interview. Okay. But this, when you, they will see when you do some kind of a um, quiz, when you apply for a job, but this will reflect from the interview. Macro uh, competencies management. When we talk about uh, human competencies or we as a resource person, a human resource, we will not have to just think of ourselves, but we have to think of the whole world of work. Okay? The connection. Okay? This is this is uh, you yourself and you graduate, you have to think upward. Okay? But the uh, organization have to think like this. Okay, they would have to define that they have the mission, the vision, the value, the strategies, and then they would see what kind of uh, core competencies 
of that particular organization is. And then it will tell you what kind of a person they would like to recruit. Okay. Okay. And the strategy to get that is like this. You will see that multi-skilling is the case in the world already. Role of competencies, uh, role competencies. What are the role competencies? Okay, the one that I said it was, it is you, right? Here. Okay, and see more. A set of competencies required to perform a given role. Each competency has a skill set. Not a skill, but a skill set. Okay, and um, we have to look also at the uh, both macro and micro level. Socially, social components, academic component, to get along uh, at, the micro, at the micro level, this would be along each career path, okay? And this is more uh, demand-driven. The core competencies, what are the core competencies? The core competencies are something that is valuable, rare, costly to imitate, and non-substitutable. So this is something that you would have to identify among yourself in order to be competitive advantage, okay? What qualifications that you would like to have that it would be costly for others to imitate you? Okay, and you are rare, you will be assets to a, a particular organization that you belong. This is the core competencies. Uh, the nexus between competence and productivity, this is the, the linkage between uh, competence and uh, demographic dividend, okay? This is based on the notion that um, uh, fundamental human competence in terms of ability to do what needs to be done, to deal productively with another person, and the environment, okay? This is based on this notion. Competence is perceived in terms of potential to achieve value accomplishments, both technical and social abilities. And um, not only at, at uh, the organizational level, but also at the national level to have to think about the connection between competence and productivity. Here they said that use and useful knowledge, skills and attitude are often considered as a central part of competence, while skills may also refer to practical knowledge. So, so far you have some idea, right, that skills and knowledge are different. And there are some kind of knowledge that uh, you can rely on. Use and usable, okay? When we talk about skills or practical knowledge, there are two kinds, explicit and tacit, okay? One may find skills resemble um, tacit knowledge if uh, the tacit knowledge is defined in terms of uh, the familiarity with the work and the ability to make adjustments about performance. So this is to tell you that there are differences in terms of skills and knowledge, but they can uh, transposition among themselves because there are some kind of uh, explicit and tacit. This is to give you more in detail. 
that uh, both knowledge and skills are transferable, okay, between individuals and as well as between different occupations and different jobs. Learning theory, sorry, uh, learning theory is maintain that uh, explicit knowledge or that an individual can declare uh, explicit means uh, something, a knowledge that you can tell this is your knowledge, okay? But the tacit knowledge is something that is deep inside you, something you don't realize that it, that is your knowledge, okay? But for the explicit knowledge, something that you can declare can be converted into more complex sets of uh, explicit knowledge by adding more and more. Okay, so it would be in terms of like this. Like person one, okay? When you read something, something that you learn get inside you and that's become tacit knowledge, okay? You don't even know that you have it. But once you, you may get it, but it, some, sometimes the knowledge is 100%, okay? And when you read, the knowledge that you read would be like uh, 50%, okay? And you try to write, to tell, to express them out by writing, okay? That is a different kind of knowledge that is expressed in your, in your note. That is explicit knowledge, okay? And that can be maximized if you give or you provide tutorial classes or you tell your colleagues, okay? Train, you, tell, you, you do the tutorial class to your colleague by giving lecture, okay, your colleague learn, and then they keep it in their own body, their own mind, okay, internalize. And when you talk, socialization, you watch this person do whatever, it becomes socialization. The key is the socialization here, okay. So they said that knowledge can be created. Um, is more like a circle of knowledge uh, creation. Um, learning by doing can internalize explicit into tacit knowledge. Um, socialization, such as a learner watches and interact with an expert, is like mentor and mentee, right? Uh, can contribute to a whole body of experience. Like if you are learning something in, in the laboratory, you read a lot, your, your supervisors told you to read a lot, you still don't understand what is what you are reading until you um, uh, sit side by side with the, your supervisor, telling him what you have learned, and he tells you what he understands, and you watching what he's doing, that is a kind of socialization. And that you realize that by doing so, your knowledge has maximized, upgraded, okay, to a whole body of experience. You learn a lot, okay. So this is something of socialization, that this is the key, okay. Once the tacit knowledge is translated and expressed in form that are comprehensible to the conscious mind of an individual and to others, the tacit knowledge is externalized to explicit knowledge. Okay, so this is what, how tacit knowledge becomes um, spelled out. Okay, this is this is money. You can earn a lot if you spell out your tacit knowledge into explicit knowledge. This is some kind of intellectual property rights that 
people would be able to see. But something, the, in, the intellectual property rights that nobody can buy from you is in the tacit knowledge. So this is some kind of uh, um, the cycle of uh, knowledge creation. Okay, something that uh, you can, once you learn something, you can create your own knowledge. So this is the key point for um, um, learning skills for you to be more competent than others. Okay, when you learn and you create your own knowledge, not just to get from from others and imitate what is going on. This is the way South Korea and Singapore is trying to do to create their own knowledge, innovation, through socialization, okay? Socialization, and then to a new loop of socialization, a new knowledge creation. So that's why they said, once you learn something, it's never stop. You can keep on thinking and thinking and thinking. And it's not good that you keep on studying by yourself in a locked a room, a, a, a closed door room. You need, when you learn something, you have to go and talk to other people to tell them this that you have learned. Sheet and chat, that you will be able to create new knowledge from that process. Knowledge position. Uh, creation and transposition of competencies, how that can be the, the case, okay? A process, such a process of knowledge generation is further supported by the concept of transposition of uh, competencies and learning. It means that the, both competencies and knowledge can be uh, moved from one position to another, okay? The transposition of competency and learning spells out the possibility for a learner's level of competency and professionalism to be elevated to a higher plane along expanding circles of the uh, competency theory that uh, show in the previous slide. Okay, according to the uh, this kind of uh, notion, learning can be turned into the function of competency itself. So knowledge and competency are different. But knowledge, how knowledge has become competency, it is um, along this kind of process, okay? This is something to tell you that a certain levels of skills or qualification or competencies can be upgraded to another level level one to level two, okay? The skills, okay? The competencies, the qualifications can be upgraded in all directions. Knowledge process in the future. This needs some kind of interrelations between the academic world and the real world of um, the labor market, right? Both arena have to create their own knowledge, okay? The academic world, the university have to create knowledge, generate knowledge. The industry have to generate knowledge also. But once they interact, there'll be knowledge, new knowledge to, to satisfy society. So far you will see that there is more um, university industry partnership in Japan. Okay, like at Keo, they would have strong partnership with Toyota so that they would create new knowledge, something like that, that serve the uh, society. So you see so far that uh, um, solar cell car or whatever, that is some kind of knowledge that has um, Intertwine between the university 
and, and Toyota. This is something that is uh, the trend. But this is only uh, something that to be strengthened further, okay? And to be transferred to others also, to the students, to the workers, so that they become uh, more and more competent in both areas, okay? The role of the faculty, okay? The curriculum, okay? And the, if these are interacted, okay, knowledge should be that we new knowledge and new talent, okay? We need some kind of a learning organization. We need research, joint research from here, best practice, what to do, okay? And then turn out into um, curriculum, industrial teacher, things like that. This will lead to here. K is some kind of a loop that will never end. Uh, the competence development and lifelong learning. What was said earlier uh, is the basis for um, uh, competence development for the knowledge society in, in this uh, century. The working group for international cooperation in skills development said in uh, 2007 something that support this kind of notion that um, um, that now it is some kind of uh, the role of uh, skills development is more and more in need for uh, competence development because um, the economy is growing. Okay, the changing need in the world economy, in the world market, and the globalization has caused changing nature of work too. For a particular person, this is what to be um, um, put as an attribute for a particular person. They should have to be like uh, a competent and productive workforce. They should have good basic skills, specific skills, and general skills. Both are to be interact together. Okay. So far, we are talking about Asia. Okay, and a uh, certain part of Asia, like Japan, is a uh, depopulation. It's in the process of depopulation already. Why not learn, why not look at the other part of the world, which is also in the process of depopulation and doing for their workforce. This is the commission of, our uh, European Commission has designed a framework for all members of the European Union to try to make their people to have this kind of qualifications throughout the 21st century. When you read this, try to think of Japan also. If you are close or you are far from this kind of framework, okay, communication in mother tongue, no problem with Japan, right? But it is the case in in your in European Union. Because there, in European Union, there are uh, several languages already, okay? It may be also the case for um, a particular country that has lots of uh, ethnic groups, okay? What about foreign languages? This is not only to know a foreign languages in the EU, but to know other foreign languages also, like to pick Japanese. You will see that more and more European um, people speak Japanese, speak Chinese, okay? Think of yourself too, okay? Mathematics, science and technology. 
your clothes here, right? This is quite similar to Japan. Digital competences? This is close to Japan, learning to learn. This I don't know, you have to tell uh, uh, for yourself, okay? Interpersonal, intercultural, social uh, competences and civic competence. Entrepreneurship, cultural expression. This is the key points, key qualifications for all European people would be um, provided throughout the 21st century. Points to note here. Expensive knowledge is a commodity, as I said earlier in the talk, in the form of intellectual property, patent, knowledge, others, sometimes they call it uh, some kind of a knowledge capital already, because we can earn and get money from that. Okay, when you write a book, that is, you can earn money from the book already, that is an explicit knowledge. Okay, but that is less valuable than the tacit knowledge. Because this is something you can earn more and more. Nobody can buy. Okay, but this is yours. Nobody can imitate yours. So that is to be accumulated enriched, but you need to have some uh, going through the process of socialization. Okay? The explicit knowledge is the strong point for developed world, but the weakness for developing world. Okay? So that's why you will see that Japan has really trying to have more publications, more and more publications in English and in other languages. Okay. Development of innovative talent is a combination of innovative attitude, basic academic skills, this is what the university has to provide you, ethics, and fundamental skills as a member of the society. This is social. This is the intimate sphere. Okay. This is the. This is the. I'm sorry. This is the public sphere. This is the intimate sphere. Okay. But the public sphere has to provide you with this. Okay. So that you will be and try to encourage you to have this kind of. Uh, um, innovative attitudes like breakthrough thinking, risk taking, decision making, drive to achieve, and leadership. Okay, this is the key innovative attitude for uh, a success in uh, the world of work. You need this breakthrough thinking, like think out of the box. This is the key point that will differentiate you from others. <coughs> and this should be the core competence for you. Breakthrough thinking. Risk taking. Why this is needed? Because the world is changing. You have to dare to take the risk. Okay. Drive to, to achieve. You, got, you have to have the guts to do. You have the guts to take a risk to do whatever. And you have to have some kind of uh, leadership. Not to be followers, but to be at the forefront. Okay. And for to be a member of society, These are what they said are uh, uh, needed. You have to have this also.
respect diversities. This is the key for the changing world so far because uh, if you work in a multinational enterprises, you have to be um, positioned somewhere outside Japan and you have to have these kind of qualifications. Okay. Before a, uh, a manager or a, a corporate transferee to be transferred from one country to another to take position as manager in another country, this is the key point for the human resource department to train you before you go to another country, both in business world and diplomatic world. Okay, diversity is to be able to respect them. Even you have to be positioned in uh, somewhere that is less developed, you have to respect them. Future prospects, this is just a case that uh, like uh, a, um, an in, a middle income country, okay? We are trying to do to follow the trend also, okay? Not just uh, developed, like a uh, developed world, like uh, um, uh, European unions or, or others. Uh, our developing countries at the middle income level is trying to do so also, okay? One thing is that we have some kind of a positive sign in terms of uh, economic development. This is um, before the, the economic crisis, okay? But even with the economic crisis, the trend of uh, uh, economic growth for 2009 for, for Asia, Southeast Asia would be uh, uh, climb up a bit and that would be better uh, thereafter, okay? And um, we have uh, been uh, doing what the uh, Peter Drucker said in, uh, in the earlier slide in terms of uh, um, secondary education. Okay. This is uh, still a uh, problem that we don't put much uh, effort in terms of vocational education, okay? But the tertiary education is, is in, uh, there's improvement there a lot already, okay? Secondary improvement, uh, tertiary and secondary improvement. But Despite the uh, positive sign, okay, there's still urgent need to move away from a uh, skilled, uh, low skilled, labor intensive to a value added and competitive industry based on identity, uh, manager expertise, and higher technical skills of labor. This is just for Thailand only. But when we compare to others, like Indonesia, Japan, Malaysia, Singapore, and South Korea, these are middle income, right? Middle income, middle income, and this is more advanced, okay. Uh, Thailand is over-reliant on resource-based and labor-intensive industry. So Thailand is some kind of uh, um, poor in terms of uh, um, prospects to cash up in the world, uh, in the uh, 21st century, okay, because we, too much rely on the um, resource, okay? Labor intensive, okay? This is labor intensive. So here, uh, half of the economy already, okay? Comparing to Indonesia, okay? Indonesia is poorer than Thailand. Comparing with South Korea, okay, like this, and this is Singapore. Malaysia. <coughs> okay, so what? China and Indonesia are still worse than than Thailand, so they have to be um, provide improvement a lot in terms of uh, uh, investment in um, um, uh, 
tertiary education. Okay. Relationship between natural resource export and wealth. This is up to um, the country. The current position of particular countries here already. Japan is here. Okay. Closer to uh, Germany and the U.S. Thailand is here, Malaysia. Okay. The strength and weakness. Okay. We are uh, limited in terms of high skilled workers. They are untrained, but but they but they are easy to train and to learn quickly. This is their their strength already. Uh, they are unmotivated and lack of work ethic. This is the real, a uh, very uh, key point. Okay, uh, unconcerned and uh, with deadline and punctuality. This is also a very strong weakness point in Thailand. Okay, but they are uh, respectful and non-confront, non. Con, uh, confrontational, okay. Uh, skilled labor, we have some, okay, and uh, doesn't cost that much. This is from a um, uh, business perspective. But there are many more of uh, the Thai workforce to be upgraded, okay, in terms of skills. Okay, and in terms of the uh, attitude, still need more responsibility, truthfulness and integrity, work commitment, and good citizenship. Okay. Others may be chaired by some uh, other countries like proficiency in English. Not many uh, Thai people speak English. Mathematics, we are good, but uh, not that good. Okay. Global literacy, we are uh, not, the majority of Thai people, they don't know about the world that much, okay? The an analytical and research skills, not many of them, okay, only the, a few of them that have this kind of thing. The, the thinking skills, okay, creative, rational thinking, analytical thinking, create, creative thinking, this is the key point. So far, we are um, the the Education Act is trying to pave the way for that already, and um, they have put the key notions in terms of basic, general, and specific skills and uh, quality of work life and the quality of life into the um, into the Education Act already. They are trying to do the uh, educational reform for lifelong learning. But lifelong learning in Thailand is different from Japan. Lifelong learning in Japan is more like it, there are like um, community libraries or whatever that you can take children to, to, to learn. Uh, Everywhere that they they can learn everywhere, okay. But in Thailand, it's more limited to some kind of a structured learning. So in Japan, it's more unstructured, right? Combination between structured and, and, and unstructured. But in Thailand, it's more structured. So we still have to to um, to upgrade our um, um, reform in terms of this to to follow the Japanese trend. Sustainable development of human competences. This is what to be um, required. This is some kind of a, um, a role of universities in Southeast Asia in Thailand is trying to do for the students to enable them to be human capital, social capital, and cultural capital. 
this is some kind of a, a new social contract. Um, let's see. Something that uh, this is the key point for um, more those in the um, business sectors is trying to rely on this. Okay, they are moving in this direction. Okay, and to get away from here already. Okay, um, they rely on the uh, competitive advantage, return, increasing return on investment, education as specialized and focused. Okay, um, the in terms of human relations must be uh, more interdependent, team oriented rather than individual oriented. In terms of uh, uh, learning, it would be more system thinking, okay? Uh, integrative approach or interdisciplinary approach. So far, it's not just interdisciplinary, but multidisciplinary approach, okay? And uh, in terms of justice and social uh, equity, laws and regulations are the key. So this is a public sphere. Okay. To assess our sustainable development of human competences, we need a system model that is to strengthen tacit knowledge, accumulation, socialization, and enrichment of the tacit knowledge. Okay, so that the uh, the knowledge is deep. Okay, the knowledge can be transpositioned. The knowledge can be transferred. The knowledge can be going on, on and on, and to be pervasive. Okay, this is to tell you that if we don't do anything in terms of our knowledge um, our transposition, or knowledge creation, or knowledge upgrading, or skills upgrading, the normal trend of the people in terms of skill would be like this. Okay? You would gain more skills when you are become um, um, beginning in the labor force and it would be more when you are like in the middle position already and then it declined. This more in terms of basic skills if you don't upgrade. But with the role of the public sphere for further training or lifelong learning, this one can be like this up here. Okay? Can this be the case? Yes. This next slide tell you that it can be the case because this is the basic skill that you get from or your education, university, if you turn down like this. But this is something that you learn on the job. The management and communication. Okay, this is workplace learning and it can be upgraded like that. Okay, so this is something that we need to be um, uh, to pay attention to in order to upgrade the skills. If this can be upgraded, this can also be upgraded. Okay, from um, after, I mean, after you are in the 40s, back there, because the previous slides we said that the uh, elderly would be still working up to the mid-70s, right? If they are still have a health, if they have health permit. And if this become low and low and decline and this, suppose this decline, how can the those in the mid-70s survive, okay? It also says that those in the mid-70s, the successful elderly, the survivors, the elderly survivors would have to be knowledge um, learner, okay? So that they have to be, this is the role of the skills that have to be upgraded, the competencies and others. 
among countries, they are uh, the literacy uh, the literacy rate vary from country to another. In Asia, it's, it is like this for male and female, and we know already that uh, the female would be, in terms of uh, the size of the female proportion, particularly when they are when they turn aging, they'll be rise more and more. Okay, so uh, this leads to uh, the role of uh, training, on the job training, so that that, that would be further upgraded. Okay, and this is some kind of a uh, number of working age adults per dependent in Southeast Asia and South Central Asia. This is a more low income and uh, middle income developing world uh, identified by the ADB, right? And this is the uh, Central, uh, which has more like um, uh, more skilled, but um, less socialization. Okay, this is this is uh, central. This is South and Central Asia, and this is Southeast Asia, declining from uh, the year two thousand thirteen. So we have to make sure that, uh, despite the fact that they are declining, they have to have be to be equipped with uh, enough. Uh, competencies and skills so that when they turn aging, okay, they would still be survived in the world market up to their mid-70s, right? But we, yeah, if we don't do that, we would have skills crisis, okay? Uh, because so far we have suffered uh, uh, those with professional skills already, Okay, and uh, we don't have um, to, uh, much um, uh, investment in, in terms of skill intensive services. So uh, we also need uh, investment in uh, the education system also. This is what the ADB maintained in 2008. Okay, and I would like to, uh, this is gonna be the last slide for the first session, that the uh, skills here, the skills crisis, what we need, okay? We looked at Thailand already, okay? But the whole ASEAN, okay, we need some kind of these skills, the shortages. Shortage of qualified staff, okay, in Southeast Asia. We lack a lot of this. We lack a lot of this, okay, professional services. So these are the key points that Southeast Asia needs to be upgraded. Okay. Before we, this will be uh, to the, um, the next session. Okay. They have the so-called Grain Korea 21. Singapore is also like that. Okay. Uh, for uh, like Myanmar, for example, uh, the low income uh, developing country, Myanmar would like the, the national agenda is to be to develop to the same level as other Southeast Asian country. Okay. For uh, Malaysia, Malaysia would like to be um, a developed country, a higher income country, equivalent to Singapore or higher. But in, at the same time, Singapore is moving away, right? To be at the forefront of developed country. Singapore is trying to do everything to be at the forefront of developed countries. Okay. 
Singapore is relatively new in terms of uh, nation building, but Singapore is trying to be above those countries that has been big powers in terms of science and technology already. So what about Japan? What is the what is the national agenda of Japan?
another position in the world. They have to think from a different perspective, like economic perspective, social perspective, geopolitics, the environmental. Environmental is not just like uh, the environment, but everything, the uh, needed policy, the society, that is in terms of the infrastructure, the laws, things like that. Okay. That should be some kind of a, a paradigm shift, a new competitive paradigm. Okay. And in from the social perspective, there would be some kind of new competitive landscape. Okay. Like I uh, I raised to you uh, during previous class in terms of the uh, of the United States is trying to design their own landscape in terms of society that they are now in the process of putting the whole immigration regime to revise the whole immigration regimes in order to attract more human capital from all over the world to get a job, to work, to contribute to the economy of the United States. This is this is something that the social landscape would be changing and be more and more competitive for the United States. Okay. That is the case before the economic crisis. But once the economic crisis is over, the United States would resume this kind of policy strenuously, I would say. Okay. Because they have, the United States has to try to bring in human capital from all over the world. Otherwise, they would go to Australia because Australia has more job opportunities, okay? And that is not good for, for, uh, for the United States if they don't do like this because the United States is also in the process of depopulation. Australia is also in the process of depopulation. So the social landscape is changing, will be changing a lot in 10 years time from now for the United States and many others, okay? The geopolitics, strategic thrust, okay? Let's talk about the United States again. Before Mr. Obama get into the office, there has been research telling already that Asia is the key factor of the future world. The United States has been ignoring Asia for quite a long time. But before Mr. Obama get into the office, all the think tanks from the United States the key positions fly, flew to Bangkok to talk about how the United, the United States would be involved in Asia, and particularly in Southeast Asia, and particularly in Thailand. Why Southeast Asia? Because there are lots of opportunities there. The population, from the perspective of demographic dividend, okay? The population in the labor force is still growing and there are potentiality for them to be upgraded. Despite the education is not very good, it's low. But training can be added. Training can be given to, to all of them in Southeast Asia. Okay. And this is some kind of uh, the strategic trust, okay? Because the economy is here, and why the United States is thinking about Southeast Asia rather than others. Another factor is that because China is giving an eye on Southeast Asia, China is closer to Southeast Asia 
and has closer relations in terms of history, in terms of culture, everything. So the United States has to do something to get in there, to be engaged in Southeast Asia. Okay. The environmental, the social contract, the new social contract, as uh, John has been said earlier in the previous slide, that the role of the government would be changing. To, and the labor market would take their prominent role comparing to the, um, to the government. But the business people are profit maximizing maximizer, right? The role of the civil society would be more pronounced. If we don't let the civil society to be more active, the world will not be changing. Okay? So we need some kind of uh, infrastructure to allow them to work. Okay? and to strengthen some kind of a, a community network. Let's talk about some kind of a aging society. When people talk about aging society, they would say, wow, that's some kind of pension. That is the burden. That is some kind of a, the government budget to put into um, social welfare for the, for the elderly, okay? But many countries that has been in depopulation process has, have been thinking that just relying on government budget to provide for the social welfare, the public transfer, is not good to the society is not good to the, to the economy because the burden would be more and more. So they are thinking of strengthen community ties to rely on themselves to help one another. Okay, here in Japan we have seen some community building in terms of community ties to, to help the elderly people to try to uh, have good health already, but that is not enough, okay? That kind of community ties has to be more uh, architectured to put all the generations into the community ties. This is not new at all. This is something to place in the old days already. Just revive them, that kind of ties. Okay, and that would be, uh, this is the key idea for the second demographic deficit. Okay, this is some kind of uh, social landscape that, uh, for example, in Southeast Asia, from a uh, demographic dividend perspective, we said that demographic dividend is a window of opportunity. Okay? It takes place when the uh, proportion of the workforce population is high comparing to the uh, proportion of the dependency ratio of the, the dependency people, which means the um, those uh, uh, 60 and above and those 15 and below, okay? This is some kind of a window of opportunity that has been, uh, that can be uh, taking place, okay? a window of opportunity. And it will be closed once this, uh, this, this lines meet, 
okay, in future times, okay. But this still going on in one country. This is uh, this is Thailand, okay. Um, but if we try to connect another window of opportunity of another country, this would be go on and no end, right? This is some kind of a changing the social landscape, okay? This is, to be the case, because ASEAN is trying, this is ASEAN, okay? This is Thailand, this is Laos, PDR, this is Myanmar, for example. The opportunities, the window of opportunities, rather than one window, okay, there'll be two, three windows that countries can enjoy. Thailand can enjoy for a long time. Myanmar can also enjoy. If uh, the social landscape change into um, some kind of um, a community, ASEAN community, okay? And this is to be the case if uh, there is a free flow of people, the human capital to move, to transfer the knowledge from here to the, to from Thailand to Laos, BDR to Myanmar, and from Myanmar and Laos, BDR to learn something from Thailand. This is something that the knowledge transfer is the key point for the uh, demographic dividend. Okay, so why the uh, Thailand would be expected to have uh, uh, in the aging society in future times, uh, Thailand can still enjoy the first demographic dividend as well as the second demographic dividend simultaneously with the ASEAN community. So as the Laos, Bidera, and Myanmar, which is, this is, as you know, this is a low-income developing and transnational, I mean, transition economies, okay? Myanmar is also a low-income developing country, okay? One can learn from another in terms of uh, um, the uh, knowledge transfer. And we have learned already, right, the role of uh, um, knowledge transposition, okay? The socialization, knowledge creation, okay? That can be also in terms of social landscape as well. And uh, when we talk about the uh, people, those in the, um, the workforce, okay, 15 to 60 and 60s and above, okay, we have learned already that in the future time there will be more part-time and temporary job, okay. This is to be put there to recognize that uh, uh, these are part of the labor market. Otherwise, this would be considered as um, something not in the in the labor market, uh, something not formal, okay, not formalized one, okay. And besides those in the formal labor market, there is also in the informal labor, labor market, which include both full-time and part-time. That is to be recognized, okay? So the idea for the, uh, the ASEAN demographic dividend to take place uh, via the ASEAN economic community, what is needed in Southeast Asia is uh, flexible, growing flexible productive labor market. The term flexible here means that to recognize the existence of the part-time job. Okay. And growing means that the retirement age is not just limited to 60, because in Thailand, in Southeast Asia, retirement is 60. 
in Japan is 65, right? Okay, so we add that that would be, they would be in, in, in the labor market beyond 60, okay? And then there should be um, provided some kind of uh, um, a center to monitor what is going on, okay? And to um, provide some kind of uh, um, some kind of uh, standard, the skill standard, okay, in terms of the, to upgrade the uh, competencies and the quality of work life, okay, the mutual recognition arrangements, the lifelong learning, this is something that put into the um, diagram for uh, the uh, demographic dividend to take place from just one demographic dividend to three demographic dividends while enjoying the um, uh, second demographic dividend simultaneously. Okay, this is something that is to be uh, strengthened and encouraged uh, when, we, when the ASEAN economic community is takes place by the year 2015 and beyond that. Okay, so far, uh, Asia has been recognized as its dynamism as the world's uh, third most important economic region after the United States and Europe, right? And besides the world's biggest source of the, of, uh, the uh, global food, Asia is also the major supplier of agricultural and industrial products as well as services also, okay? So this is why the uh, gurus always say that Asia can be uh, the future, okay, as I said earlier. Uh, previous growth in many parts of Asia was contributed by a uh, high proportion of population in the labor force age, okay. This is the wrap-up session already, okay, particularly youth adult, okay. So uh, the contribution of the so-called demographic dividend was through productive employment, asset creation, and investment. Okay. The, this will not be the case. Investment will not be the case if productive employment is unlikely. Okay. Productive employment would allow uh, people to be able to enjoy um, life and to use uh, to have certain kind of asset, okay, and to put the rest of money or the rate of return to investment. The economic growth in Asia varies, okay, but. Uh, the ADP expect that it would be much better from this year onward, okay? Not as good as the year 2007 yet, okay? But there are certain parts of Asia that uh, can be, um, um, can be playing an important role Okay, in terms of of, uh, of uh, good prospect in economic growth during the year 2009. Okay, that is um, um, South Asia. Okay, this is the key prospect. Okay, so you see the role of, uh, of India to play a more active role in the world so far. Okay, um, comparing to Southeast Asia. This is the trend of uh, population in the region. Asia had a population about this, three billion, okay, almost four in the year 2006, and there'll be more 365 million more 
by the year 2015 when ASEAN is uh, supposed to be ASEAN community, right? Okay. Yet, such population growth will be of a declining rate from an average rate of 1.4% to 1% by then. The labor force, let look into the labor force. It was 1.8 billion in 2006, which represents almost 60% of the world labor force. Okay, and um, about 12% to be added more by then. Okay. This is not a good prospect because this is some kind of a um, slowdown in the labor force growth already. Okay. Uh, this is triggered by Japan and followed by uh, um, uh, others in East Asia. We'll see the, sli the slides uh, after this. Okay, the uh, so socioeconomic challenges, okay, it was here, right? 59% of the labor force, okay, and here, okay, there'll be uh, this is a declining rate of the labor force growth, okay? 1.6% comparing to 1.3% uh, 1 up to the year 2015 comparing to 1.6 um, during uh, 1996 and 2006, okay? Uh, what about in the developed Asia, okay? Declining by 3.6 million people, driven largely by trends in Japan. China and Korea are also expected to show significant decline in the prime age population tier. Prime age population is um, from uh, 15 to to uh, 25, something like that. Okay. This represents potential demographic cliff of lower output growth. They are expected to face emerging labor shortages and other social economic consequences of aging workforce. Southeast Asia as developing Asia is also the case. Okay, the optimum condition for demographic dividend in Southeast Asia in Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam will be declining after 2010, next year, simultaneously. Malaysia and Indonesia will be following the trend after the labor force peak in the year 2020. This is the uh, trend of the people 50 and above. Okay. It was here, okay, 30%, and increased to 60% in the case of Hong Kong by the year 2050, okay? It's uh, 50 in, 30, in, in uh, 20 years from now, okay? That is followed by Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, China, the same. And then these are the um, Indonesia. India, you see, this is South Asia that has a very better prospects comparing to um, uh, East Asia and Southeast Asia. Okay. Malaysia and the Philippines has also good prospects. But the Philippines has um, poor in terms of, uh, relatively poor in terms of the um, demographic dividend because their um, uh, workforce is, is less productive 
when they work in the Philippines because they move elsewhere in the world, okay? They become diasporas already. Uh, the prospects of Asia, so uh, it tells that the prospects of Asia are varied and the challenges remain, uh, still remain for Asia if it is to maintain the dynamism in the 20th, uh, 21st century. Among the key challenges are the quality and the size of the population to so capitalize on the knowledge-based economy. Okay. Otherwise, the demographic dividend is not guaranteed. The appropriate approach is uh, to secure productive job. This is imperative to uh, not only developing uh, Asia, but I think uh, de developed Asia also still to maintain productive job for all. For all this means our working age, okay? So that also means those in the, the elderly, uh, those we have the retired elderly that has gone, we have said already that they, we expect that uh, the elderly in Asia would be still working up to the mid-70s, right? If uh, uh, they have no permit. So uh, if they get still maintained in the labor market, we have also to secure their productive job for them. And uh, this would lead to uh, the key aspects for uh, this COE program, that uh, the demographic dividend is the case that it is supposed to link local, okay, and the neighborhood and the region to the global. There must be some kind of a linkage because many aspects of a, a particular country to enjoy the demographic dividend is not just limited to the workforce within the country, but we can also enjoy workforce from elsewhere in order to, uh, to to strengthen the demographic dividend and to extend the period of the demographic dividend from one window of opportunity to three windows of opportunity, as in the case of ASEAN, that is going to be some kind of uh, uh, ASEAN economic community, okay? But if you look in terms of the United States that I mentioned, in terms of their reform uh, of uh, the uh, immigration regimes, you will see that they are trying to enjoy the demographic dividend by trying to link the whole world together, trying to bring all the human capitals into the United States in years to come, okay? That is one thing in terms of the social landscape in the uh, horizontal perspective. This is something that is particularly needed if the demographic dividend is to be maximized, to be capitalized on the social cohesion, okay? Sufficiency, community building, cultural identity, and family value, okay? This is the key point to get into the um, local landscape here, okay? The not just community building, but that to be integrated, the family value must be put as part of the community building and the identity, cultural identity must be put in there, okay? This is also reflected in the uh, the slides that I show you on the uh, European Union that they have some kind of uh, design the uh, competencies for the European people in the 21st century that they must have some kind of uh, competencies in mother tongue, okay? Competencies in the, um, in foreign languages, competencies in terms of the, um, their own culture and other culture, okay? This is something that uh, the European Union would like to provide some kind of a European 
social cohesion in there already, okay, before they go to um, the uh, to get uh, international competitiveness, okay. And in terms of international competitiveness, would be the function of efficiency, cost effectiveness, productivity, and innovation. This is different from the uh, previous decades, but this is particularly the need for the 21st century. As I said earlier, the John Nesbitt, uh, Peter Drucker, and the ADB said that this is the key innovation. This is the key for the future world already, right? And productivity is particularly the case for developing world. This is for the developed world to keep on going and for the um, middle income developing world to upgrade themselves, reposition themselves into this, right? But in all cases, efficiency and cost effectiveness are the key for international competitiveness. This is based on um, um, uh, a guru in Thailand has been trying to trying to rethink what the uh, other gurus has been saying and telling in terms of a new competitive uh, paradigm. Okay, uh, local links, uh, global reach. This is Julian University. We are trying to be a world-class university, but trying to still maintain uh, the cultural identity. Okay, this building was built on a uh, hundred years ago, and uh, this is some kind of a, a very uh, popular tourist spot. People like to go there to take pictures. If you have a chance to go there, don't forget to go take photos there. Okay. So, any questions so far? This uh, lecture on the demographic dividend and the future of Asia. Uh, the first part, uh, the first lecture was an overall perspective, right? And then there would be some kind of uh, migration, people on the move, transnational mobility, and then um, um, the human competences. Okay. Any questions so far? So can you think already what would be the future of Japan during the depopulation process? So we have to enjoy uh, the second demographic dividend, right? So it's your role here. Questions? Mm -hmm. 
uh, in the case of uh, Mackenzie Harbor, what's the difference between local and neighborhood? And uh, national is, because there are two things. One is that national is missing. National shouldn't be uh, neglected. Right, this right. one thing, the other one, what's the difference between local and neighborhood? Uh, actually, this is, uh, I think they, he, he, uh, sorry, I think he, the local here, uh, I, he was thinking in terms of, uh, um, this was thinking in terms of one particular local, right, but that can be also interpreted in terms of a, a nation also, okay? Uh, this one was designed in terms of uh, like uh, one community, one product in order to reach to the to the world, but this uh, uh, can be applied in terms of uh, a nation, national, okay, and the uh, neighbor neighboring countries, okay, and the region, and the glo and the global perspective also. Okay. What I what I was trying to explain is to uh, not just uh, local in terms of community, but in terms of a nation already. Yeah. So com communities are not included in the mechanisms. Uh, the mechanisms decided for for a different perspective. Yeah. Right. In this slide, I didn't put Japan in here because it is, uh, it is well known already that um, Japan is somewhere here already. Okay? How many percent I told you? The, uh, those uh, above 65? Remember? 22.5, right. Comparing to the uh, the fifteen and below, how many? The fifteen and below. Uh, yes, seventeen point one four. Okay. So uh, the this is this is fifty and above. Okay. Uh, but the Japanese, when they have the figures, is more like uh, sixty five and above, okay? So uh, the prospects here identified, if you look in terms of uh, uh, demographic dividend, okay? Uh, I mean the, the, uh, um, the uh, second demographic dividend, the four runners would be uh, that the policy makers in the public sphere would take, need to take uh, uh, immediate actions is uh, Japan, okay? Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, and China, and Thailand. Okay. Okay. The year 2015, okay? So it's uh, 40 years from now. Yes. 
comment. Uh, or in the case of Japan, according to the expectation of the, I don't know the official English tra tra translation, but Population Research Center in Tokyo. Yes. Uh, according to this, uh, their expectation, Japan will lose the one quarter of the current population today by the year of 2050. Mm -hmm. That will be something like 90 million people only. Mm -hmm. According to their expectation. Uh, that was uh, when? When was the projection? 2050. By the year of 2050. Oh, okay. 55. 55. Thank you.
those very tired people to study something new. Yes, yes. To let them, that, so in the case of developing countries, there must be some kind of special training that dear toward them to to let them have. If this is this is a possible for them, okay. If this is the skills that is normal, um, can normally can be maintained. This kind of skills can be uh, given to training for the elderly people to learn something and to enjoy. For example, this is my idea to enjoy the um, tourism um, business because they, if suppose the elderly, they know they have their um, cultural. Um, they have the, the culture of knowledge already, okay? That's still some kind of a fantastic knowledge that we say already, okay? And if they have the tools in terms of the uh, communications, like language, which they, they are they eager to learn, comparing to uh, computers, they eager to learn languages than computers. So uh, that, that they can turn their tacit knowledge from the culture aspects to uh, explicit knowledge and tell others. So that would contribute to the economy for the developing countries. That is one possibility. This one, right? Uh, yeah. Yes, right. Uh, it's more. This can be both in the role of university, schools, or teachers, or in workplace. Okay. So, like uh, in the earlier slide, we are talking about the role of education to provide basic education and and training. For the students to be to be um, to 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 adjust oneself to different atmosphere, like when they get to the work, they would be able to adapt, self-adjustment, and learn. Okay, so it's not just uh, the uh, basic knowledge that the university or uh, schools have to provide to the students, but some kind of uh, other skills for the students to learn how to adjust oneself to different uh, environments also. And once they get into the job, that is the role of the workplace to train uh, a particular, uh, to, to the one that they recruit, to have a particular skill that is in need for that particular workplace. And then 
that would be uh, upgraded on and on along the career path. So, so that's why that leads to the, um, in terms of the, 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 the asset does like that in terms of uh, internalization and socialization via the um, um, supervisor, okay? Because in workplace, sometimes it's normal people that they cannot provide structure and training for the newcomers or whatever, okay? They just allow the newcomers to uh, sit by, nearby the, um, those who are still in the workplace already, and then learn from them as mentor and mentee. This is something that, uh, a process that one can learn and get skills from um, the explicit knowledge that people, the mentor are saying, and the, uh, the, uh, the mentee or the, uh, the new workforce, the new workers learn and then uh, get into the tacit knowledge. Any other questions?
the world is changing, and then try to encourage them to equip with certain skills or certain knowledge that they, that they are uh, kind of uh, uh, poor or, or, or lack that kind of knowledge. For example, to, uh, to have some kind of uh, Uh, the, this one, high technology, and uh, to the market driven, that is one thing, and to realize that the world is changing um, towards the opportunities to be given by the uh, multinational enterprise. Okay, so this is something that they and uh, the uh, yeah and technologies. This is something that they still be able to uh, maximize their uh, human capital towards this path of career, so that they would be able to be uh, a factor for the dominant. Let's say okay. Uh, dominant social and political forces for the next decade. They can be a force in terms of the um, economy in um, the world economy also because let's say Japan has lots of multinational enterprises already, right? So the, the opportunities is still there and increasing already. So if they, uh, the existing or the current workforce have some kind of uh, the knowledge that of the competencies that the, the EU, uh, the eight, uh, competencies that the EU has designed for for the uh, for EU, Japan may adopt that also because both EU and Japan are in the process of depopulation, but there are still a certain proportion of the people in the working age to contribute to the economy. That is one thing. Another thing is to rely on um, more human capital from other parts of the world, like uh, the United States is doing. Because Japan, the United States, Australia, the EU, sharing the same problem. But they can still share the same opportunities if they adopt the uh, strategies that the uh, John Nesbitt or, or uh, Peter Drucker identify in terms of uh, uh, what is would be taking place in the future times. You see what I my points? Okay. That uh, this revival possibility. Uh -huh. uh, a couple of weeks ago, you, you, I think you mentioned something about this: a uh, demographic transition is a one-way ticket. It cannot be it's an irreversible oh. process. So in this sense, it oh, that is revival. yeah. In terms of the, in terms of how to uh, uh, increase the fertility rate, is it is so far as not possible in any countries. But uh, there are two options for uh, the demographic dividend to, to, uh, to be uh, capitalized on. Okay. One is to increase the fertility rate, which uh, certain countries are trying to do that already, but that takes time. But for immediate impact is to bring in, to rely on a pool of human capital from elsewhere. Yeah, that is why I, I mentioned the case of the U United States for you. Yeah, the rising the whole immigration regimes. Can I make a comment? Yeah. Um, well, uh, unfortunately, I couldn't attend your your lecture twice.
twice. I, I missed twice. So yeah. So so um, I I didn't know um, your whole lecture, but um, I could learn that um, the mo the mobile division is um, still um, has an impact to Japan Japanese society. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in migration, mm -hmm. and um, before I took your lecture, I thought that in, in the case of Japan, um, the demographic dividend was a past experience, and um, now we have no uh, no no relationship to to that. But um, you mentioned that um, the the other Asian countries' demographic dividend is um, is now has a very important relationship uh, to Japan society because of and um, in terms of a uh, migration migration construction. Yes. So um, your lecture was very uh, surprising and um, so 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 thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> to um, thank you you all a lot for um, you are very attentive and uh, raise uh, interesting and good questions uh, I myself as a lecturer also enjoy your your participation attendance to the class and uh, we can share I think uh, my lecture has provided you some kind of uh, information uh, that something that you uh, didn't learn before, and I can see from your eyes that uh, you can learn something from the lecture. And um, so, arigato uh, gozaimashita.